Amen. Well, that's him, isn't it? He's been real good to us. Been good to us at this church. He's been good to our nation. He's been good to your family. You say, preacher, you don't know all the struggles I've been through. Well, I sure don't, but he's still been good. And the reason he's been good is because he is good. Amen. And he does good because he is good. He's not good because he does good. He does good because he is good. Amen. And so when we say the Lord is good, we're saying a whole lot more than just he does good things. That's his nature. That's his character. That's who he is. And I'm glad he does all things well. Amen. Luke chapter 12 this morning. Luke chapter 12. And we want to begin reading in verse number 16. Luke 12, verse number 16. If you're able to, I want you to stand with me. Uh, if you're not able to, of course, you remain seated. But it sure is good uh, that we're able to have the, uh, the Word of God. Amen. This is not man's book. It's not a commentary. And uh, it is God's Word. And I'm thankful for that uh, this morning. You know, as we uh, uh, look at things and uh, we think about things practically, right? Because here's what I hear all the time, Brother Matt. People say, well, you know, God gave you uh, a, a brain. God gave you a mind. And uh, God gave us common sense. Well, that's true. I, I, here's my argument. Number one, common sense is not too common, right? Number two, the Bible said his ways are not our ways. And so if we're not very careful, we start trying to make the character of God human and deifying the character of man. So Jesus has been dealing with people and he'd been dealing with Pharisees and uh, he is talking to uh, these folks and he, he's talking uh, about uh, be coveting and uh, I think actually... Am I wrong, Brother Lee? Or am I supposed to be in Luke chapter 12? I'm looking at Luke 16. I'm good now. I'm good. I'm on the right page. I thought, man, what he's got, what I got don't add up, but I'm on the wrong chapter. He's right. And so Jesus is he's dealing in parables. He's talking to these Pharisees, and, and uh, he dealt with them uh, about coveting. And uh, here in verse 16, the Bible said he, he spake a parable. And I like this because Jesus was practical, wasn't he? he? He didn't use a lot of flowery words. A parable is simply a story. And the Bible said he spake a parable unto them and said, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Now, I want you to notice in the next few verses how many times the word I comes up. The Bible said, He thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to myself, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God. Boy, when you see but God, I tell you what it's doing. It's saying we're changing things up, right? But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night, uh, this night, uh, thou, thou, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Bless the reading of it. Help us as we preach it. Stir our hearts today, and if there would be one that does not know you as Savior today, I pray today would be the day of salvation for them. Touch their heart and show them their need of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So as the Lord speaks this parable, remember last week we looked at verse 15. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness. And as the Lord speaks this parable, he's looking at how how uh, if we're not careful, our, our view, our focus gets off. And let, let's be honest, that's where we are today, isn't it? Uh, the fact is, uh, if you are successful, right, it's about how much stuff you got. It's about how much money you got. It's about how much power, how much fame, whatever it is. That's what the world views as success. Well, here's the deal. You take anybody that's got, uh, uh, they had an actor, I think his name was Norm MacDonald died this week. Well, he was a famous actor, had plenty of money, but guess what, he died. 
He didn't take not one thing with him. He didn't take one dollar, one cent, one car. Didn't take his fortune and fame with him. It was left here on earth. And so if we're not careful, we work so hard at accumulating stuff that we forget to lay up treasure in heaven. And so a man that we would look at as making decisions is this man that are best for him. And here's the, the worldly philosophy, right? Uh, to thine own self be true. Do what's right for you. Do what's best for you. Do what makes you happy. Do what brings you joy. Do what you think you should do for yourself. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks of you. Is that not what we see? Is that not the philosophy we hear? But the Bible said no man lives to himself and nobody, no one dies to himself. Uh, in other words, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are to really care what people think of us because we reflect the Savior. And so as we look at his life, this man's life, we see the mirror image in the lives of many today. Not all, but many today use their life as what, if I have a house that I'm content with, boy, I need a bigger house. If I have a car, I need a better car. If I have a job, I need a better job. And I'll say this before you turn me off. There's nothing wrong with a different house or a different car for a different job. Listen to me, if that's God's will for your life. But if it's not, you should be content. Where You ought to be content anyway, right? Uh, 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 godliness with contentment, the Bible said, is great gain. So we should be content wherever we are. But if God blesses you, okay, so what? I said a thousand times, it's not wrong to have stuff. It's wrong for stuff to have you. And so since uh, our natural man would look at this man and say he is using common sense, right? He's run out of room. He ought to build bigger barns. He ought to uh, lay up stuff for later, retirement, right? Got to have that nest egg. Well, that's not, nothing wrong with planning. The Bible tells us we should plan, right? Uh, the Bible tells us we are to invest. The Bible tells us uh, uh, we're to consider the cost, right? So we have to be careful. The problem is not planning. The problem is not investing. The problem is not setting a nest egg for the future. The problem is when all your eggs are in that basket. The problem is when we forget God in our plans, and that's what this man did. Our spiritual man should question the common sense of common man. Do you hear that? The spiritual man should question the common sense of common man. Why? Because when our flesh says it's common sense, we have to question whether or not it is spiritual. So how do we do that? I want to share with you a few things in this scripture, in this title. A common man with no common sense. You know anybody like that? I do. I see a whole nation full of them. Amen. I see a whole city in Washington, D.C. full. I ain't going to get off on that. Amen. Y'all gonna get me? Y'all gonna get me in the flush if I talk about that. So, so let me share with you a couple of things. Number one is the prosperity of the man. The prosperity. See, we have to define what prosperity looks like, right? Because here the Bible said in verse 16, 17, and he spake a parable unto them: the ground of a certain rich man uh, brought forth, uh, man brought forth plentifully, right? And he thought went within himself. What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? So we see, first of all, his possessions, right? The Bible said plentifully. The word plentifully means euphoria or a sense of well-being. This guy wasn't worried about anything. Uh, he wasn't worried about where his next meal was going to come from. He wasn't worried about whether his car kicked out on the way to work. He probably had 17 chariots in there, right? Hey, he, he probably had air conditioning on his chariot, I guess. I don't know. But the Bible said plentifully he had way more than enough. Can we be honest today? We've got way more than enough, Right? And so he was doing well according to the world standards and really according to the Bible. The Bible said he was doing well. But here's the problem. He stopped remembering where the blessings came from. Maybe he never did. Maybe it's all about him, Brother Gary. But he was wealthy and continuing to acquire wealth. 
right? I think it was Rockefeller they asked one time how much money was enough. He said one more dollar. He was the richest man uh, in America, maybe one of the richest in the world, and they asked him how much was enough, and he said one more dollar. You know what? He was miserable. You can read testimony after testimony of men that had great wealth, and their greatest concern was how not to lose it, and their greatest concern was they were lonely, and they were miserable. Let me tell you this, church, money does not bring you happiness. Money does not solve your problems. Money does not fix spiritual problems. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Listen, we've spread enough money out in the last few years, trillions of dollars, and it hadn't fixed America's problems. We hadn't fixed the church's problems. Hadn't fixed our home's problems. Hadn't fixed our relationship problems. Stuff doesn't fix problems. And so his possessions, possessions are not going to fulfill you. They're not going to make you happy. They're not going to give you joy. They're not going to give you peace. Listen, his possessions, but then notice his pondering. Here's what he did. He wasn't content to say, well, maybe I can help people with what God's given me. He said in verse 17, and he thought within himself. He was, huh? You can see him, can't you? He's laying in bed at night. What am I going to do here? I, I've run out of room. I don't have uh, enough room for all my stuff. I, I, listen, I only got a 17 chariot garage and I've got two more coming I've ordered and so I've got to build a bigger garage and I don't have enough room. I only got 14 bathrooms and that's not enough for a, a family like ours and so here's what he did. He said, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? You with me? He thought. Notice you don't see here, Brother Eddie, he prayed. Nowhere do you see he thanked God. Nowhere do you say God, do you see he said, God, what do you want me to do? He thought within himself. Common sense, right? Listen to me. Common sense will trip you up. You ought to pray about everything. Common sense, tell me I should do this. Well, I would question it. Common sense tells me I should do this. I would question it. Common sense tells me I ought to go here. Common sense tells me I ought to take this job. Common sense, I go to the car dealership and they're giving me 0% finance for 847 years. That's good. Common sense tells you just do it. No, you better pray about every decision. You better pray about everything and you better have the peace of God before you move forward because when you deal with common sense, I'm telling you this flesh will mess you up. The devil will mess you up. The world will mess you up. The only person that is true, let God be true and every man a liar. You better find out the will of God and do God's will. When we live our lives for self, there is uncertainty and anxiety. Let me tell you what's going on in the world today. Doesn't have anything to do with the virus. Has to do with man is living their life according to what they want instead of what God wants. And there's uncertainty and anxiety and they're scared to death of everything in the world and they're scared to die. Listen, Christian friend, I tell you what's going on in the church. People are scared to die and they're scared to live. They're paralyzed with fear. Satan's getting all the glory. Amen. The world's getting all the glory. It's time for God's people to say, I don't care about this life. I care about the next life. I'm laying up my treasure in heaven. My friend, it's not going to be long. All this is going to be wrapped up. Jesus is coming. You better stop pondering about what else you can get and start pondering about what you can send ahead. Amen. This morning, may I say, he see his possessions, his pondering, but verse 17, notice his pride. What shall I do because I have no room right where to bestow my fruits here's this pride what shall I do I will huh what is that saying my fruits nowhere does he include God in his plan or thank him for his prosperity you cannot root God out of your plan and expect God to bless it. You better listen to me, church. If it's not God's plan, he don't have to bless it. If it's your plan, he'll let you fall on your face many times. God's plan, you better include him in everything you do. Don't you take that job without praying. Don't you buy that car. Don't you buy that house. Don't you, don't you get in that relationship without consulting God. You better be consulting God about everything and find out the will of God for your life. Because I'm telling you, my friend, you'll make a mess out of your life. 
And this man had everything this world. It was common sense. It just, Brother Eddie, it just looked like it's the right thing to do. And there's probably nobody, you're exactly right. He probably went down to the restaurant and said, you know what? Fellas, I'm going to be honest with you. Everything I touch turns to gold. Man, I'm talking about I, the crops are great this year. I don't have enough room. i tell you what I'm going to do. I've been thinking about it. Well, I, I'm so tired. I, I've been thinking about it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I've been pondering it, right? He said, I'm just going to tear down what I got and build bigger. His pride. Number two is the proposal of this man. Verse 18, 19, the Bible said, he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Here's, a, here's his proposal, ready? His plan is this. I will destroy what has been built to get what I want. Sound familiar? You're seeing it in our nation today. I've seen churches, I've seen preachers destroy another church so their church could grow. I want to say this. Boy, that's wicked. That's straight out of the pit of hell to destroy somebody else so you can be, so you can be promoted. Huh? Hey, you cannot... Glorify God by tearing others down to lift yourself up. You can't uh, glorify God by destroying another ministry so yours can be lifted up. You can't do that, friend. I'm saying whenever you start with this mindset of destruction, I'll tear down their character. I'll tear down their family. I'll tear down the church. I'll tear down their job. I'll make everybody think they're, they're sorry so I can gain. Friend, that is no sense of character at all, and God's not in it. And so here's the man, his plan was, I'll build bigger and I'll build better. I will do it. I was talking to a preacher this week and we were talking. He's going through some trials and he said, well, he just kept saying, I, God's put me here to build this church. God's put me here to build this church. God's put me here to build this church. I stopped him, Brother John, and said, God never asked you to build the church. God didn't tell us to build great churches. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Uh, he says, uh, uh, preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, the Lord adds to the church uh, that should be saved. I'm saying, folks, whenever we have to destroy to build up, something's wrong. Amen. This man said, I'm going to tear down all the stuff I've already done, and I'm going to build bigger and better. This is my plan. I will accomplish my dream. I will do my work. I'll build my stuff. No words to give God any credit or ask God what he wants. So his plan, his principle. Look at his principle. Store for me and my want later. Is that what he said? He said, I'll be pull down my barns, build greater. There will I bestow all my fruits in verse 18. Look at verse 19. Now I will say to my soul, soul. Didn't say I'll say to God said, I'll say to my soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, watch, watch this, I'm going to squirrel it away for later. Nothing wrong with saving. Nothing wrong with investing. But watch, don't be a stinking miser. Oh, oh, if I give to missions, I might not have enough for me. Common sense would tell you that, right? Do you remember that little, that little woman? Gave all she had. That wasn't common sense, was it? I can see it. Jesus said all these Pharisees coming in, putting their money in the offering plate, right? And they had much, Brother Tim. They had a lot of stuff. They were... The, the, what, what it looked like when they were given the amount. She just had a couple little coins. Jesus said she gave all she had. Don't, don't look at the floor. We ain't praying yet. We worried about us. 
we worried about tomorrow and the next day and I need to retire and I, I got to have a vacation home down at the beach in the mountains and God's okay with all that as long as I'm tipping him on Sunday. That's what common sense tells you. Now I'm not the Holy Spirit. You give what God tells you to give. But you better pray about what you give to missions and you better pray about your tithes and offerings. You better give what God tells you to give, not what you think is right. Amen, hallelujah. Because the principle of this thing is God controls it all. It ain't yours to start with. And I want to tell you this, church. You rob God, God will take it from you. Oh, no. God only requires 10%. He gives me the 90. Let me let, me let you in on a news flash. God owns all of it, 100%. He lends you 90 but you're still supposed to be a good steward of the 90. You rob God with a 10, I'll guarantee you're not a good steward of the 90. Hey, man, good preaching. Hey, I'm just saying this. The principle we should live by is that I am his and there is no indication this man used it for the good of anybody else. He didn't say this family's in need and God's given me all this and I'm going to help them and I'm going to give them food and I'm going to help them build a house and I'm going to give to missions and I'm going to do... He didn't, the Bible didn't say he did any of that. He said I, what I've got I'm going to keep for myself because I'm going to need it one day. You can be tight-fisted if you want to. But watch this. When you're like this and you won't do this, you can't do this either. God don't pour blessings in that. God pours blessings in this. And the only way to have that is to do that. If you won't let go of it, friend, you're not going to get it. You can be a reservoir if you want to, but God wants to use conduits. His principle. Then look at his presumption. I'm, I'm moving on. Hang with me. We're moving fast. We're not on the bus, praise God. We're, on the, we're in the fast lane right now. Hang with me. Notice his presumption. He said in verse 19, for, uh, he said, He's as much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Here's was his, this was his presumption. He's presuming, right? He's presuming he has years to live. Now watch, young person, you sitting here saying, great preacher, that's good for all them old people. That's good for all them old people because they're, they're going to die. So you think you're guaranteed tomorrow? You know what's on the news right now? This, this girl and her boyfriend went on this cross-country expedition First of all, I'm sitting here thinking, again, just what are you doing letting your daughter go on a cross-country expedition with somebody that ain't her husband? What are you? But here this guy comes back without her in her car and says he don't know where she's at. Now this is a young girl, probably, I don't know, late teens, early 20s, whatever she is. It's a good chance she's dead. Do you think when she went on that trip, she was thinking, I'm probably not going to make it back from this trip? No. She thought, we're going to go out and have our fun, and then we'll come back, go to college, or get whatever they're going to do. This is our summer, and and I just want to live it up. I'm young, and I need to do this. Now listen to me. I don't care how old you are. If you're five years old or you're 105 years old, you're not guaranteed one breath. You're not guaranteed one tomorrow. You're not guaranteed to be back in church tonight in the evening service. You're not guaranteed that we'll ever get to the altar call. You can you say, oh, preach, you're being morbid. I'm being realistic. You can go out here today, turn left, head back down toward Tyro, be in a head-on collision. You can walk out here today, have a heart attack before you walk to your car. I'm just saying, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed another breath. You're not guaranteed retirement. You're not guaranteed to have money in the bank. You don't believe it? You wait and see. 
You go ahead and keep putting, squirreling all your money in your retirement. And one day I'm going to retire and I'm going to travel. I'm gonna, listen, they'll take it from you like that. Man, they tax you from the time you're born to the time you die and then after you die. You better have hope in something besides your bank account, your IRA. You better have your hope in Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're presuming, Brother Jimmy, we're presuming that we have tomorrow. And this man said, I don't have just a tomorrow. I've got many tomorrows. And I'm just going to relax and take it easy and enjoy life. He makes no preparation for eternity. This morning you better make preparation for eternity. Before you walk out of here today, you better make preparation for eternity because you're not guaranteed that you'll have another opportunity. Then finally, number three, the prospect. The Bible said in verse 20, but God. Here he is, right? Going along. Just going along. I'm planning on next year and here's my five-year plan and my ten-year plan and here's my retirement plan. Here's my path and my career path and I want to be the president of the company and I want to have bigger barns and once these are filled up, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Brother Jeff, I'm going to build bigger barns and I'm going to put more stuff in it. I'm going to have more chariots and I'm going to have more donkeys and more horses and I'm going to have a bigger house and I'm just going to keep on till one day I can just relax and enjoy it, right? Is that not how we are? The Bible said here, but God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Watch this and I'm done. Here's what he deals with. He deals with his finality. No tomorrow. He's saying this. You're never going to see what you plan for. Because you plan for the wrong thing. You plan for your prosperity on this earth. But you didn't plan for eternity. And then he deals with his foolishness. He will lose what's most important to him. He didn't care about anything else, right? He didn't care about people. Didn't care about family. Didn't care about God. And God said, I'm getting ready to take away from you the thing that's most important. Now you listen, all right? Give me your attention. You say, oh, that's terrible, preacher. That's exactly right. Here's what I want to ask you. What's most important to you? You say, oh, God. God's most important to me. Here's what I want you to look at. I want you to look at your calendar, and I want you to look at your checkbook. The most important thing to people is what they spend their time, their talent, and their tithe on. Yeah? Where do you spend your time, the talents that God gives you, and the tithe? Your treasure. That's what's most important to you. Maybe your family, right? You say, oh, well, you know what, preacher, I, I, I want to spend time with my family. Great. But you don't have to take 23 vacations a year. You don't have to go to the beach, mountains, anywhere else every weekend. Oh, but the kids, they, they want to play ball, preacher. And I want them to, they might make it into the major leagues one day. I won't break your heart, but they ain't making it to the major leagues. There's a big gap between hitting a ball off a tee and somebody throwing 100 miles an hour at your head. You're probably not going to the major leagues, but you can know God. Oh, but preacher, I want them to have all these friends. and they, they, I don't want them to be some reject. I want to have all these friends. Same friends that are going to take them away from God. Those are the ones you want them to have. Hello. What 
is standing in the way in your relationship with God. It may not be barns. It may not be build bigger. It may be your status. It may be, I don't know what it is. What's your idol? Because an idol is anything that takes the place of God. What is it in your life? That's what you got to look at. Ah, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay, preacher. I'm in good health, and, and I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking for the future, and nothing wrong with planning. But what if you don't get there? Are you going to be able to stand before God and say, Lord, I've done all that you've asked me to do? Because here's the, here, here's the, the reality of it. We'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us. God doesn't care how much money you made. He doesn't care about the title on your desk. He doesn't care about, you know, uh, how many whatevers you have. Did you do what I asked you to do? Pretty simple, isn't it? What are you going to do with eternity this morning? You say, oh, I've got plenty of time. I don't have to make a decision. Sure you do. You either decide for Jesus, and if you don't say yes to him, you're saying no to him. If you're not a Christian, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. This is your opportunity because you're not guaranteed another breath. If you are a Christian, you say, well, I'm saved and on my way to heaven, but I'm not living for the Lord. Well, how long is it going to take before you start living for the Lord? You're not guaranteed tomorrow, neither am I. God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything. Thou fool, this night, if you were this man, and I was this man, and we had to stand before God this night, first of all, would you, would you go to heaven because you placed your trust in Christ? Secondly, if you have placed your trust in Christ, would you, he say, well done, good and faithful servant? Common man with no common sense. Don't let that be said of you. Don't let it be said of me. Man, he had a lot of common sense. But we, he didn't serve God. Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. No one's looking around. Miss Susan's coming to the piano. I want to ask you this question. Nobody's looking around. I'll not embarrass you. Won't come to you. I want to pray for you. Would you slip your hand up this morning and say, Pastor, if I died today, this moment, if I drew my last breath, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. And I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Thank you. Put it down. Is there another? If I died right now, I don't know that I'd go to heaven, preacher. Would you pray for me? Is there another? Let's just nothing to be embarrassed about. It's honesty. Honesty. Would you be honest? If I die today, thank you. Is there another? Thank you. Maybe this morning you look at your life and say, you know what, that, that may not be my exact picture of what that guy was in the Bible, but I see a lot of that in me. Making all these plans, preparations, but I'm not thinking about God. Won't you come and give your life to the Lord this morning? Say, you know what, God, I want you to have first place in my life. Father, thank you for those dear precious souls that raised their hand this morning. There may have been others that didn't raise their hand, but in their heart they're unsettled where they'd spend eternity. Now in the next few minutes during this invitation time, would you give them or whoever is not sure how to be saved, where they'll spend eternity, the confidence to step out of their seat just so someone can take the Bible and show them how they can know they're on their way to heaven. Thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Nobody's looking around if you raised your hand or you didn't. You want to know this morning how you can know for sure you'll go to heaven. If you'll come, we'll show you. Christian friend, I tell you what, I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I think people raised their hand and said, I'm lost. I know what I, where I'd be. I'd be on this altar praying for them. Come. Ma'am, sir, would you come? You raised your hand. You didn't. 
God spoke to your heart this morning, would you come? Don't walk out of here and not know. You can know. You can know. You mind the Lord, come on. While she plays.